This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. The FCPA Compliance Report is the longest-running podcast in compliance, engaging a wide variety of compliance-related guests and topics. Each week, Tom Fox brings you the top commentators and information which will inform your compliance program going forward. Join us again for the top podcast in compliance, hosted by the voice of compliance, Tom Fox. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode, I visit with Philip Urosky. Philip is a partner at Sherman and Sterling and the editor in chief of the always great Sherman and Sterling annual FCPA Digest. We take a look at the 2020 FCPA Digest, including such issues as FCPA enforcement actions and strategies, some perennial statutory issues, compliance guidance, what were some of the unusual developments. Uh, over the past year regarding FCPA and developments in the United Kingdom, what they portend for SFO prosecutions. It's a fascinating exploration of a great resource. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today you're in for one of the annual treats we have on the FCPA Compliance Report. And that's because I have Philip Urofsky back. Phil is a partner at Sherman & Sterling, but for the purposes of this podcast, he's the editor of the FCPA Digest. So, uh, Philip, I'm thrilled to have you back to talk about Sh- Sherman and Sterling's most excellent uh, FCPA Digest. Ah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, I-, I just like to hop right into it because, as always, you guys put together not only substantive information that people, compliance practitioners, white collar defense lawyers, and probably government folks use, but there's a, a-, a great amount of analysis. So uh, starting off with the uh, overall uh, numbers from 2019, we saw just some dramatic numbers. What did you guys see in that? Well, uh, just first on on who reads who reads our work, I I, I do have to say I was meeting with the SEC and they looked at me over the table one time. They say, you know, we read what you write. And it was more of a threat than a appreciation. I thought so. uh, We we we. uh, have to be aware of our readership. Um, what have we seen in the last year? You know, it, it's in to some degree, it's a return to normalcy, I think. Uh, you know, in the first uh, period following the, uh, the change in administration, things really seem, seemed to slow down. And But our view, and as we wrote at the time, was that this was likely more an issue of bureaucracy than um, and the lack of presidential appointees within the department. Uh, than uh, than it was a change in an approach, and I think that's only been you know borne out over the past year. We, as in the past, we see that uh, a few cases account for uh, uh, the lion's share of of the of the fines that were collected. When you know the, they're really you know how you count cases always is a bit of a term of art, and if you compare our count to another firm's count or to the government's count, you know, we always come up with different numbers and then try to figure out why. We think, you know, you, if you count individual entities, you get, a, you get one number, but really it's only 13 corporate groups that were really at issue in the corporate cases. And two of them, the Erickson case and the MTS case, account for, you know, the, as I said, the lion's share of, of, uh, of the penalties collected last year. But what I what I think is perhaps more interesting than that is that in the past we have sought to figure out what is the real average penalty uh, that is assessed against companies in an FCPA case, uh, and if you take out outliers, you take out the bottom, you know, the really small ones at the bottom, and you take out the really big ones at the top. In the past, we had seen numbers in the areas of 15 to 25 million, maybe as an average fine. And the, and that was sort of the same case last year in 2018, in 2018, but in 2017 and now 2019, we're seeing a higher number. Uh, and I, I think, you know, uh, for instance, I, I believe last year uh, it was 
in the area of about 80, 80 million dollars as an average penalty, not counting if you take out the Ericsson and the MTS cases. And, and I think that is largely reflective of perhaps a little bit more uh, selectivity on the DOJ side. Uh, they tend, it seems, and over the past couple of years to be taking the position, look, between our FCPA corporate compliance, uh, corporate enforcement policy, which has the, the so-called declinations with disgorgement, and a general deferring of sm smaller cases to the SEC, you wind up with the DJ DOJ only bringing larger cases. And I think that is why you're starting to see the average penalty go up because of that select, partially because of that selection of which cases they will bring to fruition. Philip, we also saw a, a large number of individual, uh, both guilty pleas, and we had some trials this year. A question I've really been wanting to ask you, in 2019, was that really uh, a buildup or at least a follow-up from the Yates memo of uh, 2015, or was that something else, in your opinion? I think it's I, I think no, I think it's a follow on from the Yates memo and, and a general uh, realignment. You know, the Yates memo reflected sort of a institutional view and it's, it wasn't necessarily a new institutional view, but it was sort of a, uh, you know, a, let's say a wake up call, perhaps to some prosecutors that, you know, yeah, big fines are nice. And certainly we want to continue prosecuting corporations, but you we, we are being perceived and we shouldn't be perceived as saying that corporations can buy themselves by, you know, protection for their uh, executives by not by, by simply, you know, rolling over themselves and paying their fine and leaving people uh, protect, you know, from from safe from prosecution. You know, back in back when we wrote the very first principles of federal prosecution of corporations, the, the, what was named the Holder Memo, the original Holder Memo. You know, we said very clearly, I, I was one of the, uh, the author of that, and I, I said, you know, we said very clearly at the time, you can't trade a corporate plea or corporate enforcement for, you know, for uh, protection of individuals, and you can't throw people under the bus to get protection of the corporation. Both of them are important prosecution priorities. And I think the Yates memo was intended to sort of rebalance that to remind people saying, you know, all these big cases are great, but you've got to go after the individuals and the corporations have to understand that we're, you're, we're going to go after individuals. That was the Obama administration, and I think the Trump administration, the, the people who are there now, have perhaps embraced that even more so. Maybe the pendulum has swung even more away from corporate prosecutions and toward individual prosecutions in a way that you see in the, in the corporate enforcement policy, for instance, this idea of you've got to come in, you've got to come in early, and you've got to tell us these people and you know, who these people are, and if you don't, you don't get cooperation credit and you don't get, you know, you might not even get voluntary disclosure credit. Uh, so I think that there is a bit of a philosophical underpinning to it, but it does go back, go back to the eighth memo. It goes back even earlier. And uh, the reason why I think there's a lot of, there's been a, there was a number of, you know, a large number of uh, charges brought this year and, and, and an unusual number of trials. I think some of them are just, it just takes time to get them out of the court system and onto the, you know, onto the trial docket. Um, but generally, the DOJ was pretty successful this year with their trials. Philip, I'd like to turn to the section entitled Perennial Statutory Issues. And first, I would say I really appreciated that title because it doesn't simply focus on statutory issues, but really perennial ones whether they are uh, perennially uh, debated or uh, even uh, raise questions with uh, compliance practitioners. Uh, the first one is uh, parent subsidiary liability. I come from the civil side of the docket and um, where parent subsidiary liability is something that's almost routinely seen, but on the criminal side, it's very different. Do you feel the Department of Justice has adequately addressed the white collar defense bar's concerns around that, particularly the comments by Brian Bitkowski at the uh, ACI uh, National Conference in Washington? Uh, yeah, so, so this, this is one of my favorite issues. I, and uh, in a non-FCPA case, we wound up writing some fairly substantial white papers trying to push the government, the DOJ, back to where they ought to be. Uh, and I think uh, Brian Bitkowski's statements were definitely in the right direction. 
you know, now we have to see how it works out as, uh, you know, because he, he, you know, he hedged his bets. He said, of course, you know, this is all subject to the facts, the specific facts of a case and so on. But traditionally, you know, there, there, look, parent subsidiary liability is not the same as uh, principal agent liability. And they put them together in a way that said, <clears throat> and I you know I talked to some of my former colleagues over there and they said, look, why is this any different than an employee uh, under corporate liability? Uh, the corporation is responsible for any employee or agent acting within the scope of their duties and for the benefit of the company and isn't a subsidiary uh, isn't the subsidiary's duties to you know, do business, make money and act for the benefit of the parent. And why isn't that? Why is that different than employee liability? But of course, it's different. The whole purpose of subsidiaries is to establish a different legal person and to create a, 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 a separation of liability unless you do something that changes that. And traditionally in the DOJ, and you can go back and look at the DOJ's, uh, you know, the fraud sections submissions or the United States submissions to the OECD working group on, on, the, on what parent subsidiary liability means. It meant that the parent had to authorize, direct, or control the, con the illegal conduct of the subsidiary before you would hold the parent responsible for the subsidiary's uh, you know, bribery in this case. And they went, starting with the SEC and then the DOJ, started going with the theory that because the parent has the legal authority to control the subsidiary, the subsidiary is its agent, and whether the parent knows or didn't know the co that the subsidiary was doing these illegal things, it's nevertheless responsible for it. So sort of a strict liability going up the corporate chain. And it's simply wrong. It's, it's, it's wrong under corporate law, it's wrong, and it's, it's wrong under criminal law, and it's wrong under DOJ policy. And hearing uh, the AAG say that, or, or like acknowledge that perhaps they went a bit far in a couple of cases and they're going to pull it back, uh, is hopeful. It's hopeful. It, it's, uh, and now we'll just see in the next year, maybe, or so, how it works out in actual cases. We had two cases which I call the princeling cases, but uh, it involved hirings of sons and daughters and family members of government officials and employees at state-owned enterprises, specifically involving banks. And mm -hmm. these were Barclays and Deutsche Bank. And I was wondering uh, if you thought this ended once and all the question of whether or not a job or a child or relative can be a thing of value under the FCPA, or is it still perhaps an open question? Well, let me say this. I think it ended the question of whether the department believes that it's a thing of value. Uh, I don't think it answers, answers the question at all. Uh, and this has been a, you know, another one of my, you know, hobby horses, I guess, is, it, you know, I tend to read the statute first. And the statute says you must provide a thing of value to the government official. And, you know, directly or indirectly, through an intermediary or however, but nevertheless, the word to is clearly in there. It's at a benefit to the government official. So if you have a son or daughter or brother or a sister, uh, you know, I'm not carve out spouse because that's just perhaps maybe too closely affiliated. But if you have a, a, a family member of a government official, Simply giving them a job without demonstrating that that somehow benefited the government official is not, to me, a thing of value to the government official. Even if you're doing it to influence the official, this is not a, you know, the FCPA doesn't cover peddling influence. It doesn't cover that. Of, you know, even if a, if a relative goes out and says, I can go talk to my brother if you pay me. Unless you're, unless he, he, you're, you're paying him so he will pay his brother it's not a payment to the government official. And in this case, the problem with these cases is they have really bad facts. You know, it's the old adage of bad facts making bad law. You have cases where the people not only do some of, uh, some of the, uh, not just in these two cases, but in the, in the previous cases involving other banks, you had spreadsheets where they say, if we hire this person and this is his his, his, you know, his, the government official relative, and that's the job, that's the contract we went, we were looking for, you know, so they draw the line, they drew the, connected the dots, even though they didn't actually show a benefit to the government official, they connected the dots. And unless you get to some sort of idea that a thing of value is the intangible good feelings that the, that the government official 
might feel toward you because you're taking this ne'er-do-well, un- unqualified son or daughter off of his hands, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty uh, stretch to me to say that just hiring someone is, a, it, you know, uh, uh, hiring one person benefits another person unless you can draw that link. It's the, in the scholarship cases, that's a different thing. You're paying a scholarship to a, a, to a son or daughter of a government official well, that son, that government official doesn't have to pay tuition now. That's that's a benefit. That's some, you know, he doesn't have to reach into his pocket. He's reaching into your pocket. That's different, it seems to me, than hiring a government official's relative. These cases, you know, the, the allegations are that they were unqualified or that they didn't show up for work or they didn't do this. But what if you hired a perfectly qualified, entirely qualified uh, person to be a banker or a finance accountant or a lawyer or whatever, and it happens to be a person, or maybe it's deliberately a person who is related to a government official, but you do every, you know, but you're not using them to, uh, you know, you, you follow the rules, you you have a recusal, you have all this kind of stuff. Are you actually providing a benefit to the government official? I don't think so, but I'm not sure the government agrees with me on that. Uh, I'd next like to turn to compliance guidance. Uh, many of the listeners to this podcast are compliance professionals in-house, um, and we had the Criminal Division's 2019 guidance. And I wanted to ask, what did you see either different or perhaps the significance of this release of information? Well, I don't know that I saw a huge amount of significance other than that it starts to, you know, the more they, t- they explain what they're looking for, the help, more helpful it is. Um, I, I, I have to admit that I don't necessarily go into the weeds on these thi- on these guidance. I find it helpful to know what the factors are so I can try to speak their language. If there's an example, if I can get on the right side of that example, I'm going to do it. Um, it's, it's, it was, uh, you know, in some ways, you know, the original guidance that came out a couple of years ago was almost a check the box. It was a list. List. It was just a list. This at least explains some of the theory of the, uh, or, or the uh, behind what's important to the government. I think that's helpful. But um, I don't. I don't know that there's. You know, if you look at what's here in this guidance, and you look at what's in other, um, you know, similar go- go- government guidance uh, from other agencies or even other governments, you, you see basically the same elements that you normally would. We had a uh, specific uh, policy change by the Department of Justice, or at least a formalization, I should say. I think it's a formalization, yeah. A codification of the inability to pay. And that's really what I wanted to ask you. Is this really a codification or formalization of an existing DOJ practice or really something new? Uh, no, I, I think it's, 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 uh, it's intended to be, and I think it is, reflective of what they're, what they're doing, but the, what they were doing was in the past was more, I think, um, you know, flying by the seat of their pants. And I don't mean that in a bad sense. It's just like it was prosecutorial discretion unless you got to a ju- in front of a judge. And so you'd go in and you'd make an ar- you'd, you'd, you'd make all sorts of arguments and you'd bring in all sorts of uh, people. You'd bring in your CFO, you'd bring in your, your, um, your, your controller or you'd, you know, whoever to try to say, you know, this is, this is why we can't pay, you know, what we understand would likely be the penalty. The, what, what, what they did here, it seems to me, is similar to what we did back with the Holder Memo, which was to say, let's, ha- let's agree on the vocabulary, not on the outcome. They were very clear. You know, we were clear back then and they're clear now. This isn't an outcome determinative test. This is a question of what if the factors that a prosecutor can consider and is considering, and you should come in prepared to talk about them. Um, and, and, and to that extent, similar to, uh, you know, what, what, you know what the Holder Memo that now became the Phillip factors, this is sort of the same type of thing. You know, if you're going to make this argument, because they've, beca- they've encountered this, obviously, we've seen it in a couple of FCPA cases over the past couple of years. If you're going to make this argument, we want you to, to address it in this way, because that way we can compare apples to apples instead of, you know, the, uh, apples to oranges. Um, the, um, the next area I wanted to go over was uh, the section you guys entitled Unusual Developments. And we, di- we have had uh, some, uh, if not unusual, cases that have gone a little bit different directions. 
One uh, is not an FCPA case. It's outside the United States. And it's a prosecution against both Shell and E&I uh, for uh, payments uh, to the Nigerian government. Are you, what are you guys watching for in that case? And what do compliance practitioners need to be watching for as well? Well, I, I think actually one of the most interesting things I saw there is we have seen multinational uh, enforcement actions or investigations mostly being driven out of the United States. Sometimes, uh, as in the Siemens case, initiated, uh, you know, by, by, that was initiated by the German prosecutor. Uh, but, but very often, these, these big international cases, uh, and I'm sorry, and I, of course, I have to give credit, you know, to, uh, you know, the, the car wash cases in, in, in Brazil, which were originated there. But most of the other ones, you know, are initiated by the United States, pushed by the United States. And not only that, the U.S. just can't step back. They, once, they get, once they see something, they are going to grab hold of it and they're going to take, you know, and they're going to insist to be part of it. And what I see, what's interesting in the, uh, in the Shell case is that, you know, you have investigators uh, in the Netherlands, you have investigators in Nigeria, you have, um, uh, you know, investigators in, 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 in Italy and the U.S. did take a look, a hard look at it, but they apparently, according to Shell, anyhow, have stepped back and said we're not, you know, we're essentially declined. Um, and you know, we don't know why they did that. It could be a true declination that there's simply not evidence of a violation, or there's not evidence of jurisdiction, uh, though you know that hasn't stopped them before. Um, but. It's interesting that, you know, for years we have argued, we, uh, you know, both when I was in the government and since, that when you look at the OECD convention expects that the parties will cooperate and allocate and, and, and you know, that the appropriate co company, country rather, will take, will take responsibility for enforcing uh, the law. And we've argued to the DOJ in, you know, over, over the years that, it's not the world, the global enforcement authority, and that when a appropriate foreign enforcement authority with with credibility and and the ability to bring that case is bringing it against the company and has more equity, more uh, you know connection to the company, we don't need to be part of that. And and maybe this is that. Maybe this is the example of that happening. Uh, you know, don't know. The other sort of compliance aspect of it is this issue. This very strange issue, you know, in the Netherlands involving attorney-client privilege, and a, a court order that basically said Shell has to turn over its internal records because the lawyers involved weren't registered under with the with the Dutch bar. Sort of a hard thing for an international company. I mean, uh, you know, Shell, Shell famously, you know, it, it's the Royal Dutch. Uh, company, it, it used to have, you know, uh, both US, UK and Dutch aspects to it. Uh, and to other companies that have offices in, let's say, in the Netherlands, but also uh, in the United States and elsewhere, this is this creates a, a uh, you know, a privilege we, uh, issue that maybe that becomes very difficult. I mean, if you have a, a council that you're sort of rotating around and placing them where they need to be because of whatever reason, but they're not necessarily practicing Dutch law, they're not, or not even, and not qualified, frankly, under a Dutch law to register with the bar, but all of a sudden they lose the privilege, uh, apparently, in the, in the Netherlands. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's an issue that is going to have to be looked at by the legal departments to figure out, do we, you know, how do we how do we address this issue? How do we protect ourselves here? Another issue that got a lot of attention uh, here in the United States was the Oxif restitution case. Uh, what did you guys see in that case, and how are you following it? Well, restitution has always been an interesting issue in the FCPA world because obviously, you know, you know, bribery sound bribery sounds in fraud. Uh, in, in, to some extent, and to a large extent, and so the idea here is that a an official has taken a private benefit that really belongs to his, the the government. So, you know, the government is the victim. The foreign government is the victim. But when the foreign government is just rife with corruption, 
you know, the U.S. prosecutors, you know, properly have no interest in, pay, in, in including a restitution aspect uh, in the settlement. It's going just to give the money back in some way to the very people who, who you know, who can't control the corruption in the first place. You know, we had instances of of that, you know, even back, back, uh, you know, in my day, as I say, you know, I say when they, you know, when, you know, foreign governments would come to us and say, well, we, we know you're going to bring this case. We know you're going to um, collect you know, or you, you froze in X amount of dollars. We want it. We, you know, they stole it from us. You should give it to us. And we're like, yeah, and not, not so much. Um, and then the kleptocracy initiative within the Department of Justice developed various ways of trying to address that kind of issue by saying, uh, if, for instance, in the Kazakhstan case, that the money would be deposited into a trust fund administered by the World Bank for the benefit of the people, you know, for the benefit of people of Kazakhstan and, and projects that would be agreed upon between the World Bank and the Kazakh, Kazakhstani government. Um, and that's what happened in that case. And there's been some similar things. More recently, we're seeing uh, where the, you know, uh, foreign governments or foreign agencies come in and say, you know, go into court and challenge it. We saw, for instance, ICE do that in a, a, a case we see Petro Ecuador um, or um, uh, do it in in in, in, um, in another case, and so far without success. Now, Oxif flips this a little bit to say, well, wait, a what about private parties? Uh, I'm an investor, I would, or I, or I'm a competitor, one or the other, and I was. Uh, you know, I was harmed by the bribes that were paid by this company that the company is now a, a, admitting to. So I don't even have to go to civil court and sue them and prove beyond the by preponderance of evidence. They've admitted it in in criminal court, and I can use. I should be able. To, I shouldn't have to even bring a separate lawsuit. I'm a victim, and I'm prote I'm protected by the Victims' uh, Rights Act. It, I get the theory. I really do. I'm not sure that the link between the harm in the Oxif case, you know, to that to that company and the bribery uh, that, that the company admitted to, is is altogether clear. But what it does do is it makes it very difficult to get re have certainty in a in a settlement. You you know uh, in a settlement that's going to court, because you wind up with. Um, because of Victim Rights Act, among other things, and then and and then you go in front of a judge, and the judge, is, as they did in the Oxif case, says, "Yeah, I, I agree. I think this that this 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 uh, party has a right to try to at least prove that it was harmed and what the harm was, and and then collect that on top of any the agreed upon fine or forfeiture uh, or disgorgement in the in the that you already agreed to with the." Uh, government. So what's the solution? Uh, you, you, you're going to have to talk, you know, you're going to have to try to persuade the government that they would agree to an offset saying that, you know, the ultimate settlement is X amount of dollars, which will be split up, you know, and should the court order that restitution, then that would be credited against the penalty. Or what you're going to do is you'll see even more non-prosecution agreements rather than deferred prosecution agreements. So you don't have to show, or, or guilty pleas for that matter. So you don't have to show up in court. It just becomes an agreement between the government and, and you uh, without charges filed. Uh, you know, that's another way of trying to issue, you know, avoid this issue. If they want to come in to sue you in court in a civil case, well, the, you know, no, no settlement was going to prevent that, but at least you don't, you, you don't wind up with a, uh, a drawn out uh, hearing and, and unpredictable uh, results in a, in the criminal case. Philip, uh, I now like, like to turn to developments in the United Kingdom. And from where I saw sat, I saw a bit of an up and down year with the uh, serious fraud office, but I was wondering uh, what you guys thought of, or at least are telling clients about the corporate cooperation initiative by the SFO. Well, when we look at these things, and we do look at these things, we're always trying to figure out, are they going, are they aligned with the U.S. practice, you know, with which we're, we're all very familiar, or are they, you know, taking a different pat, uh, tact, and, and where does that bring them? Um, so, you know, it's interesting right now that the, 
you know, the head of the SFO is a former U.S. prosecutor, you know, uh, uh, because you can see how she very much is sort of trying to apply the lessons and her experience that she's had in the United States within the British system. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think what we have here is what I found somewhat interesting is with the sort of guy, the guidance, uh, the corporate cooperation initiative, it sort of says is, you know, we want corporations to cooperate, go above and beyond, uh, you know, the, the, the minimum uh, requirements to show us that they, they really are, are, are on our side or, are, you know, helping us. Um, but their first position is that, you know, experienced counsel is going to know what cooperation is and we shouldn't have to tell them. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know it when you see it type of thing, which is not the most helpful guidance you're ever going to find. So they did then provide, you know, factors that are familiar. The ones, and then you, as you'll see, as you saw, I'm sure in our, in our article, that the one that that, that particularly gets tricky is that of um, privilege. Because like, like the United States, you know, like the DOJ uh, policy, the SFO is not supposed to be asking for privileged information, but they have indicated through this policy a fairly, uh, you know, skeptical view toward what is privileged, and um, which is not unlike what you sometimes encounter with U.S. prosecutors as well. And, you know, you see some echoes of that actually even in the guidance that, you know, they expect you to to um, in the United States you know, to, to be sure that you're actually claiming privilege for the you know and that it's appropriate for you to claim it. Here in the in the UK, they you know, they, they actually are requiring you know independent counsel, which I'm assuming means external counsel at least, uh, uh, to certify that the documents that are being withheld are in fact covered by the privilege. And they've, you know, obviously reserved their right, their ability to challenge that, that, that it, not, not, not from the perspective of forcing you to give over privileged information, but from a, a somewhat skeptical view of what is privileged and, uh, uh, and a willingness to challenge it, or at least a purported willingness to challenge it in court, as they have in some cases. Uh, so that's, you know... Uh, so whereas in the United States, you know, there seems to be a somewhat more, there's more trust anyhow between the U.S. government and external counsel on that if we provide you with a privilege log, it is in fact privileged unless the government is, or as in the, in rare cases has come to a view as the crime fraud, the crime fraud exception or something like that. Here, they do seem to be even more skeptical and they're not even talking about crime fraud. They're talking about just uh, a fairly limited view, it seems, of what is covered by the privilege or not, um, and that's going to, you know, that that that's going to, you know, carry us through to uh, uh, in the UK anyhow. You know, a, a perhaps a more confrontational back and forth over what is what is cooperation and what what is it that you're expected to hand over and not hand over. Well, Philip, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but uh, you started off with an interesting comment. I thought which was in a meeting the uh, the SEC told told you uh, that they read the FCPA digest and when i hear something like that and and i've been told that as well it makes me realize that because of our audience because of the readership because of the people who are reading the materials we put out we have to get it right and you guys certainly get it right you do have opinions you do state those opinions uh, but you also give us the facts and l- allow us to uh, come to our own conclusions uh, based upon great reporting and great legal analysis. So on behalf of the compliance community, I wanted to thank you. And I greatly look forward to uh, perhaps visiting with you again in uh, January of next year. (laughs) Well, I, I look forward to it too. Thanks very much.